Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Turbo Podcast, Season 10, Episode 47. He's Dave Bryan. I'm Alex Kazor, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being with us on this Monday, Steelers Nation. Dave, Steelers get the victory yesterday, and it was ugly. It was messy. It is not without controversy going forward, but wow, you get the victory, and that's all I care about at this point here in late November. Uh, yeah, the victory, victory Monday. Hey, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving this year with the uh, Steelers in the in the playoff picture. How about hey, that? Uh, I did not expect to say those sports after Ben Roethlisberger went down week two. Yeah, me, me. Well, I mean, look, uh, and especially after the, 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 you know, the next couple of games took place and all like that. But yeah, uh, the Steelers got some help. Boy, did, <laughs> what are Oakland Raiders fans? What, what are they? What are they talking about on the terrible Raiders podcast? <laughs> uh, uh, How they this, lost the thirty-four to three to the Jets. <laughs> yeah, getting blown out uh, by the Jets and all. But uh, hey. Uh, uh, you know, you can only play the games that are on your schedule and, and try to win in whatever fashion that you can. Uh, that's the biggest thing that uh, you, you try to do right now if you're the Steelers, especially with kind of still a very fragile offense and a good defense. Uh, get out of stadiums, as Mike Tomlin says, with a W and go on to the next one. And they did that. They got a little bit of help uh, on the uh, on the AFC scoreboard you know, this weekend here. So uh, here they are. We'll see what happens with the uh, Baltimore Ravens later tonight against the uh, against the Rams out in L.A. But uh, at worst, like I said, we're going to be eating our turkey and our ham uh, with the Steelers at uh, in the in the number six seed in the AFC. So all is well right now. Absolutely. 16-10 victory over the Bengals on Sunday. But that was in, in doing so and securing the victory. That meant a quarterback change. And that obviously is going to be the biggest topic of discussion coming off the game throughout the week and then really probably for the rest of the season based on whatever decision Mike Tomlin makes. So Duck Hodges comes in for Mason Rudolph in the second drive of the second half because Rudolph had really just struggled. And I think that's a good place to start, Dave. And ultimately, I think it was the right decision at the time. And based on result, it proved to be the right decision as well. Yeah, uh, I thought he would have waited one more series. Uh, I put on a Twitter machine that uh, I bet I bet Mike Tomlin gives him uh, one more. Once he threw that one in the, at the legs of Deontay, uh, his final throw, mm-hmm. you had to know, <laughs> uh, you know, something could happen at that point. Even before the game, I put uh, on, on Twitter, look, you'll be interested to see how, how Rudolph responds from all this adversity this week. But uh, – uh, if he doesn't, whatever happens, happens, and that happens, happened. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, no way to sugarcoat it again with Rudolph. This was really a fight-or-flight kind of game for him. We talked about that all week, everything he's been through. Can he respond from that? I was optimistic, clearly uh, not correct, though, and, and and he struggled. And I thought before halftime that you, you could give Rudolph the first drive of the second half just to see if there was a mini reset, getting the ball, see if you could get any sort of spark. And if you couldn't, and they didn't, then you got to turn to Duck Hodges. That's the scenario that played out. Hodges, what, second pass attempt of the game, a 79-yard touchdown to James Washington. No, it wasn't really anything sparkling after that, but you have to include that play. That was the biggest play of the game, and Hodges made it. I don't think Rudolph was capable of making that big play to win you that game. Point blank, if you didn't bench Rudolph, Steelers, I think, lose that game. Uh, he was definitely a troubled kid uh, right from the get-go. Looked like uh, it didn't look like he was settled in at all. Uh, it just looked more like a carryover from the game uh, against the Browns with him. Uh, the the red zone interception. I mean, I can't wait to see the end zone view of that because I mm-hmm. don't have a clue who is trying to throw it to. Yeah, the ball was tipped, but even if it isn't tipped at the line of scrimmage. Uh, is he is he trying to throw to Tevin Jones in the middle of the field? It's got two guys around him. Uh, you know, I, it just it didn't make any sense uh, where he was trying to throw that ball because I think he all you had uh, all, he had like three or four spot routes uh, uh, on that play there. So that was troublesome uh, at a, at a wrong time there. Uh, you know, the, like I said, the final throw, his mechanics had just went to. Uh, went all, went to all hell at that point, 
you know, uh, not stepping into his throws and all. So uh, this is a kid that, uh, that that's severely damaged right now. When you go back through it kind of mentally, you know, he hops off the bench in the game against the Seahawks. He didn't look bad at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you'll make the mistake. Uh, he had a couple mistakes against the 49ers. Well, then you fast forward a couple games had, which was arguably probably his best game against the Rams. And then just, just, just goes the other way after that, you know? So, uh, has certainly regressed, uh, since the Rams game and really, uh, regressed even further than kind of what maybe his starting point was, in those first couple of games against the Seahawks and the Rams. So, you know, I don't know how much of the concussion, you know, the hit, uh, uh, you know, technically, you know, he hasn't been really right, I don't guess, since he got knocked out of that uh, Baltimore game. But uh, uh, that was kind of the last, I don't know, what, what you'd call kind of signature uh, or or – uh, head turning play that he made, and he just so happy got knocked out uh, on on that play on top of it there. But uh, uh, you know, coming off, he you know, wondered how he would do on this long week, and then you have the adversity mixed in with with all the uh, the ac- the uh, you know, uh, racist accusations mm-hmm. and all, and he just he wasn't able to overcome it at all. And you know, once you pull the plug on him now, the way that you did. Uh, you know, you have to me. You have to stay with Duck Hodges right now because of the fact that you have, you got a damage, you got a damaged young quarterback, and then now you can't go into a game against a against a team that a lot of this started against in the Browns. You know, that's still kind of an open, fresh wound, if you will, and you can't have him go into that looking over his back on top of it. And he would. You know, there's no two ways around it uh, th- that he would. So, uh, has he taken his last snap, talking about Rudolph, this season? I doubt it. But, uh, uh, you know, I also don't think that he needs to start this next game against the Browns. I think instead, you back him up behind Hodges, and then if, if Hodges has, you know, uh, 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 gets off to an awful start or something, then you can go back that other way. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I mean, I agree. Hodges has to be the guy because you're in you're in win mode right now. We're no longer talking about be a team that has to be in evaluation mode and seeing what they have in Rudolph and trying to get that scouting report on him. I think a you've gotten a lot of information on Rudolph, not a bit, not a lot of it positive, not a lot of it lately at least positive. Um, and b you know you're trying to do the things that helps your team win. I mean, again, if the season ended today, the Seals are in the playoffs, and you got to fight for that that wild card spot, that sixth spot, the rest of the way. So you got to make decisions that are best for your team winning, as opposed to what's best for the long term evaluation of Mason Rudolph. And I think Hodges is the better option right now. I want to see him really be able to work with consistent known starter reps, which has been very fleeting for him this year, whether you're talking Baltimore, whether you're talking this game, he's got very limited or no practice reps. So so I'm with you. Although, I mean, the idea of do you go back to Rudolph potentially would always, of course, depend on how Hodges plays, but you really hate trying to rotate quarterbacks like this. You want to try to give one guy a vote of confidence, let him really go out there and, and, and feel confident that he's not going to get benched. You don't want Hodges looking over his shoulder either. But I agree. It was just it was just rough yesterday for Rudolph. We have a post on SteelersDepot.com that breaks down the litany of issues, whether you're talking mechanical, placement, timing, overall accuracy, decision-making, really every sort of negative box a quarterback could check, Rudolph checked yesterday. And even on that last throw to Deontay, uh, the one before he got pulled, you see that the mechanical issues have been popping up, the front leg, front knee locking up, and he just can't have any sort of velocity or placement on the throw, and he just looked like just looked like a shell of himself yesterday. Now it doesn't matter what you and I would do, but uh, what what is Mike Tomlin going to do here? He kind of was a little vague, and he's he's left himself a lot of wiggle room here uh, in the post game comments. Uh, he was asked, "Did you go into the game with any?" Uh, notion that you might have a short leash on uh, Mason. He goes, I don't, I don't prepare for failure in that way. I don't prepare for success. But, uh, but like all you guys hear me say all the time, I always have a hardcore plan. But I'm light on my feet in case necessary adjustments are made. Blah blah blah. Uh, how how difficult this decision was that? I don't worry about the, the uh, degree of difficulty. Tomlin said, "There's a lot of difficulties that come with this job. Yada yada. There's a lot of difficulties that come with jobs of men who play. We all got to do it. Uh, how important was the timing? He didn't want to get you know get 
didn't get too much into that. He says, uh, what I needed to see, uh, I just saw enough of what I needed to see and thought we needed a spark. And whatever time of game that was, was whatever time of the game that uh, that was. Uh, when he was asked when Duck comes in. Uh, and makes a play like that with a big touchdown if you, uh, uh, you know, and he's talking about kind of a spark and Tomlin kind of jokes, yeah, I looked pretty smart, didn't I, <laughs> uh, at that point. And then he goes on, uh, uh, he says, look, it's football. We're not going to read too much into it. He made some plays, but you can't take anything away from James Washington. He's got a point here. Uh, what, uh, what, what he did to produce that play, uh, and after the catch and so forth, man, we're just all rowing together. You'll make more out of ducks contributions than need be. So be it. It comes with a position. They get too much credit at times. They get too much blame at times. They all understand the nature of that. Just like I understand the nature of the criticism and things that come in my position. He was then asked, Mike, when do you want to have the decision on your quarterback for next week? I may have it as I stand here right now, but I'm just not going to share it with you guys well he uh, is he going to share it uh uh tuesday we'll see but i mean at some point between tuesday and wednesday you would think it's going to leak out uh who it is but it just it sounds like he's left himself some wiggle room here he has and i don't know where he's what direction he's gonna go like i said i think it should be hodges i think most people would agree it should be hodges and i hope it gets announced tomorrow because you don't want to be doing this thing where you're splitting reps during the week and neither guy is prepared enough i think you need to come in tuesday and say you've watched the tape this is going to be our guy he's going to get the full complement of starter reps to get them prepared and ready to play whether you're talking rudolph or hodges both young guys that need every single rep that they can uh when you're going to be playing a, a cleveland team that just shut down your offense you know two weeks ago so i think if you try to open this thing up for a, a true battle in the middle of a week, in the middle of a playoff race, it's going to come back to bite you. I would hope that whatever decision Tomlin makes, he makes it decisively, and that decision comes down tomorrow at his press conference. Uh, once again, if it if it maybe wasn't Cleveland, and if this this whole other stuff <laughs> had been going on on top of it, I could maybe see Tomlin uh, saying, "Look, you know, uh, we needed a spark. Duck, Duck gave us a spark. Uh, we're going to go back to Mason." Uh, uh, this week, but I think uh, due to the nature of everything that's kind of transpired with Mason the last several weeks here, and now that you have pulled the plug on him, I think you just, I think you're asking for even uh, worse, potentially, if you have him going into a game looking over his shoulder. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think, I don't think you have to worry about Devlin Hodges going into this game looking over his shoulder, you know, uh, you know, he, he, he's got more of the just happy to be here, <laughs> you, right. you know, you know uh, a, a attitude right now. And uh, look, I mean, uh, let, let's not sugarcoat it either. I'm not going to judge Devlin Hodges off of uh, off of one touchdown pass either. You know, I mean, he only completed five passes in that game. So uh, you go back to what he did in the game against the, the, the Chargers. There's still not a lot to go on as far as what he's done. So, but, you know, with that, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the ability to extend the play, however, comma, I thought, I thought he could have, uh, he needs to help Alejandro Villanueva out a, a, a few times when some of those deep drops in the pocket there, especially, I think if you go back and look at that second one, you know, he stands at the 10 yard mark, uh, after snap and, you know. Uh, if Villanueva is going to try to protect that inside, it's hard to protect both the inside and the outside against a, you know some of these better speed rushers. So I think that played a role in that sack there. I'd like to see Devlin you know, use the pocket, you know, step up into the pocket when he can a little bit more. Uh, but I mean, we're only talking about five completions that he had in that game. But with that, you know, I think he should at least start this next game against the Browns to see what he uh, what, what he can give you in that aspect. I agree, and Hodges was introspective enough after the game to admit, basically, that he got a little too frenetic after that big touchdown to James. He said, quote, I can't wait to go back and watch myself because I knew after that first touchdown, I, I, I kind of get a little antsy, a little jitterish, a lot of excitement. I need to do a better job of settling down after a big play, just get better. So there were times where he was leaving the pocket too early and trying to run around and stuff that you really can't get away with consistently uh, at the NFL level. But I, I agree with what Tomlin says is that, you know, the quarterback gets – 
probably too much of the credit, too much of the blame. But, I mean, the bottom line is that Hodges made plays that, that Rudolph couldn't. He helped move, move the offense when Rudolph really struggled to, or at least couldn't finish drives, and, and Hodges was more capable of that. And as you said, he's, he's a fearless guy, and that's the trait that he has that Rudolph Lee doesn't have. Hodges is playing with house money here. He's not supposed to be here right now. He's an undrafted rookie free agent from Sanford. He's now starting or, or coming on in, in relief in an NFL game in his rookie year in the middle of a playoff race for the Pittsburgh Steelers. That's not supposed to happen. So the dude's just fearless talking about and just go out there and rip it and sling it and have fun. And uh, and he is. I think he's just, just probably in a better place mentally than, than Rudolph right now and just playing better because of it as well. Uh, the uh, the big the, the big pass to uh, to James Washington there, you know, his ability to kind of sit back there and not, uh, uh, you know, uh, hold on to the football that, you know, that extra tick there gave gave him the ability to see that uh, that Jesse Bates was going to to stay up underneath there in the middle of the field. Uh, it's kind of weird looking the way we don't have the all 22 on that yet. We just have kind of the next gen stats uh, uh, play on that. Uh, you know, cover is it cover three and Bates just trying to protect the chains, you know, or is it more of an inverted cover two, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in that situation. Once again, I have to see that kind of in, in, in the live, you know, uh, all all 22 aspect of it to get a better feel on it. But whatever it was, it, the play, uh, he had enough time to see Bates basically stand still at, at, at the chains to protect, I guess it was uh, McDonald in the middle of the field there. And, you know, he can't put too much on that ball either mm-hmm. uh, because you do have the, uh, uh, the two outside guys really – you know, by the time he winds up and the distance that ball has to go, those two outside guys are converging in the middle of the field. Uh, so if you put a little bit more air uh, under that, that you know, uh, that that probably gets picked by 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 one of the two there. In fact, they're playing it, I think, as if the ball is going to go a little bit deeper. Now, uh, James Washington deserves a lot of credit because he caught that ball at like the 49 yard line. Mm-hmm. You know, so. Uh, uh, you know, and, and when you go back through and you look at the rest of Devlin Hodges' throws, uh, you know, ball place ball placement I don't really think's ever been kind of the the, uh, the 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 issue with him going back to that preseason game of his that I charted there. But there were a few other decisions there where I, I didn't think uh, weren't great. Now, however, I'd much rather see them throw the ball uh, out of bounds in a way the way he did I think on a couple of those uh, there. So you know, a week of practice, will a full week of practice help him? Well, it won't hurt him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, again, this guy got limited reps coming into yesterday's game, got some scout team reps. It wasn't much. You know, Rudolph's been the guy, and, and so I want to see him with more consistent reps. He got it against the Chargers and played okay, you know, far from great, but enough to win the game. And, and every time he's come in, he's done enough to to be in position to win the game against Baltimore. The juju fumble, not his fault. But every time he stepped in, he's, there, he's either won you the game or put you in position to win the game, which is a pretty good – uh, track record for a guy that again should not be where he is right now it's it's remarkable the story in the play so um i i just think he offers a more of a fearless attitude and he also was able to extend the play with his legs i think that's so critical i think whenever you can extend the play with your legs especially with a bunch of receivers that are young inexperienced probably not the most technical precise route runners especially new guys are just getting here you can extend the play and let someone just open up in a scramble drill and that's how you move the football cool i think it's almost so in some ways the most effective way for this offense to be able to move the football uh, right now, just extend the play and hope something opens up. He can take off with his legs and make a play if something, uh, if nothing's available downfield either. So um, I just think, you know, as much as we, we've talked about patience with Rudolph, and I don't want to, again, make any conclusions on it yet because I want to see what happens when the season ends. You know, who knows what's going to happen in these final couple of games. But um, I think you have to do what's, what's in the best interest of the team, what gives you the best chance to win. And it's hard to argue right now that Duck Hodges does not give you the best chance to win. Uh, do you think Mason pl- played his last snap this season? I mean, I don't know. Probably not. I imagine at some point he comes in, whether you know they decide to start Rudolph again well, in a me- in a meaningful uh, in a meaningful atmosphere. Yeah. Well, I I don't know. I mean, my gut says no. At some point, he'll find his way back in because they they do like him. They do want to let him have an opportunity to bounce back. I, I don't know exactly the scenario it would be that would cause him to come back in, whether that's injury or hard to support player. They just feel like Rudolph's taken enough of a breather to reset and look at the sidelines for a week or two. I'm not sure how that's going to go, but my gut's telling me that Rudolph is going to play again at some point this season. Oh, uh, my yeah, mine too. Would you would you would you hold him out? All together this week. In other words, would you uh, would you let Paxton back up uh, Duck this week, 
being as how you're talking about the nature of the opponent and all like that. In no. Him. I mean, no. in other words, would you give him a full reset week? No, because I still want him to get reps. I still want him to have that in helmet perspective. I don't want him to be so disengaged if I don't dress him that he just feels like, you know, he's not even involved anymore. I want him to be involved. I want him to feel like he's he's ready and preparing. Um, and, and honestly, he's probably still a better player than Paxton Lynch is right now who has not dressed and when was the last time he threw a pass in a game that mattered. So I would still have Rudolph be uh, the backup, but I would roll with Hodges as a starter. You know, I went back and uh, uh, skimming around some plays of his uh, last night talking about Rudolph and all. Uh, he had more of that kind of that carefree coming off the bench in Seattle, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the, I, you know, the more he thinks about it sometimes, you know, I think it, it has been horrible for him. You yeah, know, he's a guy that lives in his head clearly. Uh, he, you know, the, the more time he seems to have, has, has had to have to prepare, you know, he he just doesn't function. He just you know. Uh, now look, he also looks like he's picked up a little. I don't know, like a little hitch in his throat too, uh, that I don't remember seeing at Oklahoma State uh, either. And he you know he's holding the ball a little bit too long in instances there early in the game. Uh, I mean, he could have been out of that game a lot earlier if he overthrows Benny Snell mm-hmm. uh, uh, on that one. You know, Benny Snell made a great. You know, went up and got that ball. If he doesn't, you've got a, I think a, uh, a curl flat kind of uh, linebacker back behind him, uh, uh, ready to pick that one off. And uh, you know, he he didn't make the throw down the right side to uh, to to Deion Kane, but even that ball was was quote unquote. You know, a 50-50 ball, interceptable, if you will. If he puts that more on the backside, does Kane still get it? I don't know. I mean, you're getting into kind of semantics there. Uh, if there, you know, the only, I went back through every throw of his. You know, the only positive that, uh, or at least that I saw, the only positive throw that, that, that Mason made in that, in that game yesterday? To Deontay Johnson on third down? No, uh, I wasn't going to go there. I was going to go the deep ball that he overthrew uh, uh, Washington just mm. barely deep down the throw because that was like a 51-yard throw. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a nice throw. Washington just missed it by about a step. You know, that's uh, you know at least showed that he can get it out there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, a little bit. And, you know, if he connect, hey, how how would that how would that uh, play have changed the game? You know, sure. he, he just he needs uh, he needs to string together a couple plays there, and also he's going to have to learn that every play just cannot take place in the pocket. You know, and until he shows the ability to feel feel uh, the rush and what's developing ahead of in front of him better, uh, he's going to be in that same situation there. He just he does not have kind of the the feel or the pocket presence you know uh that he definitely had which wasn't a lot i mean in that offense that he ran with gundy at 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 oklahoma state uh obviously a lot of changes but uh uh yeah i mean he uh it it seemed like a continuation from the browns game kind of right from Mm -hmm. the start yeah and i just think again i mean the best best thing for the team was to start duck would you agree oh yeah you have like i said you have to now yeah. I, mean, I don't I don't think you have a choice. We'll see what Tomlin ha- has to say. I think Tomlin is setting himself up for a bad situation if he doesn't because once again I think this is a this is a kid in Rudolph that that uh I I don't think it's going to be good putting him against the Browns with him looking over his shoulder. Mm, yeah. I'm with you. All right, Dave, let's talk about the rest of this offense. I know you spent so much time on on Rudolph and Hodges, but that is going to be the central discussion point. Uh, for the next week and potentially the rest of the season, uh, let's look at the run should, game. Should should he come right out? Uh, I mean, even if he's already told the team, should should uh, should he come right out and say it, or should he should he let uh, let the Browns kind of play the guessing game here? I mean, not a lot of tape for the Browns to look at anyway. Who who cares if they know? Yeah, no, I would uh, I would come out and say it just for confidence in the team. You know, we, this is our guy. You know, we're not going to hide from that. We're gonna we're gonna make that decisive decision. Plus, it's going to be evident. Some practice reps, reporters are going to be able to suss out the information based on who's going to be working. And you don't want players to have to play coy. Just you know, let's be decisive about it. Let's make the decision. Let's not be scared of it. Let's embrace. If you're gonna make a quarterback change, and and go out there and and, and just uh, attack it. All right, we'll see what Tomlin has to say on Tuesday. This week will move kind of quick with it being Thanksgiving week as well, too. So, mm-hmm. All right, Dave, let's look at the run game now. Um, I know it wasn't the greatest performance ever, but you just felt like you had a better run game than you've had in, in quite some time. And granted, you expect that when you get Benny Snell back and when you're facing one of the worst run defenses in football in the Bengals. But 
I really was impressed by Benny Snell um, to be able to log 21 carries, most by any rookie Steelers running back since Bell's rookie season uh, back in what was it, 2013. Uh, the ball security, the the consistent effort that he showed pushing the power forward for a guy that's missed a couple weeks as a rookie, has probably tired legs out there, uh, making that great snag from Rudolph on third down that could have avoided avoided disaster very early in that game. Uh, just very impressed with, with the run game of, of guys like Benny Snell and Kareth White Jr., but um, I, I thought Snell was – one of the underratedly really good players yesterday, ball security too, was critical. Uh, get to let him touch that, uh, carry the football late in the game, take good care of it, not being loose with the football. I just thought a really impressive performance all around. Yeah, I told you I wanted to see some Benny Snell football. Mm-hmm. So and... did Mike Tomlin after the game. I saw Benny Snell and yells out, Benny Snell football. And, right. Uh, I got to love it. Look, uh, you know, he's the second best. He's the second best running back on this team, mm-hmm. you know, and – you know, would uh, if he can give James Conner a few weeks to uh, a few weeks to get uh, to get healthier here. Uh, there's something to be said about at least uh, getting getting some positive. How many negative plays did they have yesterday? Do you remember? Uh, in in the run game? Yeah, in the run game. I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna have to. I not a lot. I, yeah, there wasn't a lot, but I mean, I say it, it felt. I guess what I'm saying is it felt fewer. Uh, mm-hmm. in, in the run game, because man, those those two yard, three yard losses, and they kill you, man. Yep. Uh, uh, it kind of felt, you know, I don't know how much of you watched, uh, how much you watched of the the Bengals game against the Raiders. It had that same kind of feel to it as far as production to it, you know, because Josh Jacobs didn't have, uh, uh, you know, there were some one and two yard run game uh, runs in there. You know, mm-hmm. I'm trying to let me let me sort this out real quick here and I'll let you know, according to the charting here, what we have uh, yards negative and zero yard gains. OK, they, they had three. They had three rushes that went for. Let's see here. That was a Kareth White off left guard. Uh, in the first quarter that went for negative one, they had Benny Snell for no gain, Benny Snell for no gain, but that was a holding call on Vinette anyway. Uh, they had a Kareth White, uh, Kareth White for left tackle for negative one. Uh, they had Benny Snell for negative one and they had Benny Snell for no gain with, uh, what one was that? Uh, 423 in the third quarter there. So the thing is, is we're not seeing the negative two or negative three, uh, 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 you know, runs and all like that. But uh, Benny looked like he's moving the pile, the short yards. I wrote about that. I think I got that coming up on CedarsDepot.com here in about five, ten minutes or whenever. In fact, it might be, it might have just went up uh, a mm-hmm. little while ago there. But uh, they were technically three of four in the third and three yards or less uh, category. And I think before the week, you wrote about how they were twenty something percent worst in the league, and it wasn't even close. Yeah, about twenty eight percent on third and three and closer. And 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 it wasn't even close. Like the next team was like forty one percent or something, right? Uh I'd have to look. I don't remember quite there was it was bad no matter how you slice it. They were as effective on third and seven plus as they were in third and three and closer, uh which is terrible. So it's nice to see them have much more short yard success yesterday. Right. So they converted three or four. Uh their one fail uh, there, Benny Snell had two of those uh, pickups. Mason Rudolph had one on a quarterback sneak. The one fail that they had was uh, uh, the in the second quarter there when when uh, Mason uh, threw the ball away was intentional grounding all uh, on that play. And they had another one that they potentially were going to run on a third and three. And I had a little bit a bit of a curious call there. Did did you really see Jalen Samuels flinch that bad uh, on 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 that uh, on that false start? Regardless, uh, he was called for false start on that play, and that turned a third and three into a third and eight. Uh, but they did convert. You know that uh, I guess that's a good thing, and I think that was the play that 
Uh, the third and eight play was the one that you referenced as 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 maybe being Mason's best throw of the game. I think that was the one over to the left side, mm-hmm. right right by the chains uh, that that to to uh, Deontay Johnson that they converted there. So uh, you got some production in 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 the in in the short yards game, and Lord knows you needed that. Uh, and you was able to run the football. I, I don't know what the overall success rate was, but I know it was damn near closer to fifty percent this time. And if you could have a successful run rate. Of, of damn near close to 50% with your running backs. Uh, and you can pick up those short yardage, you know, a high percentage of those short yardage along the way. Uh, that That's going to bode well for your offense, especially when you mix in a couple of explosive plays. Benny Snell had another explosive play. He's got three on the season, Alex, and he leads the team. Do you believe that? <laughs> and what, uh, two of them have come on third and short, third and one, third and three? Uh, I know the another one yesterday late late in the game came mm-hmm. in a third and one or whatnot. And, Seattle week two, he had a 24-yard run. Uh, and uh, Kareth White uh, had had uh, had one yesterday as well, too. And, look, this is a team that you should have been able to run on. You know, uh, the, mm-hmm. the, tape, the tape showed that uh, the Steelers running left and to the Raiders' right was where – the Raider, I mean, uh, uh, the Bengals is where the Bengals have struggled this year, and they ran a lot of power. Yeah, you saw, <laughs> you saw, uh, uh, you that nothing warms the cockles of my heart <laughs> more. <laughs> the than caster s- picked up a lot of air miles yesterday. Yeah, he did. Uh, he had a nice log block or two along 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 the way in there too. Him turning back. You know, mm-hmm. uh, on on some of those as well too. So they ran the power. I don't know, six, five, six, seven times. Oh, I think more. It was probably. I'm gonna have to count. It's probably ten or fifteen times. Okay. It was. Their, it was their most dominant and their most successful run scheme. And uh, they had success. You know, overall, it's kind of you know chip chip away at the stone. And we we saw a couple of years ago Todd Haley run run the living mess out of that power. Mm-hmm. You know, against the Bengals, yeah. Against right. the Bengals too. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you, if if they can't stop it, keep running it. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it was good to see the run game, uh, and and that helps. Like it or not, that helps the passing game. You know, like I said, you don't have to run a ton of times. You don't have to get so caught up in the run pass bounce. But if you can run early in games and run successful early in games, it allows for you to run later in games and hopefully you can still be successful in doing so. And that's what happened in this game against the Bengals. They ran the ball to help convert on third and short. They ran the ball to close out the game. They ran the ball when the, when the passing game didn't work in the first half. And, and those are all things you look for. And, and so Snell did well. Kareth White coming in. And, you know, I knew Tom was going to use the phrase hand in the pile, which is what he used when he referenced White and, and, and Deion Kane. But you saw the, the traits that White brings. And what's pretty unique to that r- running back room right now is that White's a guy that can win the edge and has some speed and some burst and explosiveness. And you saw that. Now, I wish he would play a little bit more. I know he's limited by personnel groupings and learn the playbook and he can't be an every down kind of guy the way that maybe a Benny Snell could be but I thought he could have played a little bit more after that really kind of blistering start but you saw that element of it and um, I think it was smart to go with Snell and White and really put Edmonds and Samuels on the back burner. Uh, I was surprised White got that many snaps at all to be honest with you so I mm-hmm. was I was you know I was tickled to see him get the ball that much. Yeah I just thought he played a lot in the first you know, quarter and a half, and then he was really quiet for basically the rest of the game. And I thought he could have played a little bit more, but um, again, he brought that explosive element this team hasn't had in in quite some time in the backfield. Yeah, he he has that little bit of quick burst and and wiggle and all. And I don't think the I don't think the Bengals were were, were ready for it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a guy you haven't seen on tape, and and a guy that um is just a a pretty special, well, not a special, a super special athlete, but a dude's got speed, and, and this running back room has really no speed outside of him, so that was an important element of it. So just again, overall, you know, it was against a bad run defense, and it wasn't pretty, and it was a lot of death by a thousand paper cuts, but um I thought they won the matchups they had to, talking Snell and White Jr. And, you know, that's going to be the committee really going forward. I, I've seen enough of Trey Edmonds. I've seen enough of Jalen Samuels, each guy getting two carries yesterday. Then once Connor returns, obviously he's going to be the guy again. But who knows when James Conner is going to be able to return. Yeah, here, here's at least what it affords you the opportunity to do right now. Uh, I, I feel you can go. I, I'll be shocked if James Conner suits up this week. I think you will be as well, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm not expecting it at least. Uh you know, if you can run Snell and uh, and and have White have another week of practice, and you know, obviously Samuels, I mean, you've got enough right there to uh, to you know. And look, you 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 the arrows pointing up as far as pro- productivity. I wouldn't mess with anything right now. Plus, it gives you another week to get James Conner healthy. Mm-hmm. So you know, uh, this is a running back room that's been 
beat up this year, right? So you got to let these guys kind of, when you can, not rush them back. And, you know, it's, it's too bad that that, that uh, Benny Snell wouldn't have been ready a week earlier, right? You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, maybe you don't rush James Conner back in, 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 in that situation there. But we've been hollering for this running game to hopefully get better all season. And it was against a team that you should have had success with uh, uh, against the Bengals. But, you know, the Browns are another team that they should be able to run on, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's the plus there. Use that, use that same group of backs again, uh, against the Browns, let James Conner rest. And if you, hopefully you can pull out a win here and then down, down the stretch drive here, you know, get, get, get Conner back. And when you do get Conner back, you got a guy in there in Snell that, you know, you don't have to have, have James Conner carry the football 21 times. Right. Uh, yeah. An injured backfield is an understatement. They've had six true running backs carry the ball this year. That is the most for the Steelers since 1989. Wow. Uh, they had seven true, not cl- not including fullbacks here, but true running backs. Uh, so it's been a long time they've had to deal with this kind of turnover. But I think now they're getting healthier, and then hopefully James Conner comes back, and they're getting some more clarity in the in the backfield, which is uh, as good as time as ever when you're trying to make a playoff push here in, in November, December, when the weather gets pretty ugly. Where, where, eight, eight, what, when, what was that year, 89? Mm-hmm. I can was, pull that, the, was that the rich? Uh, the mm, rich uh, you're you're getting it. Huh? You're getting it. I hear, I hear the wheels turn. Let me pull up. Let me pull up the list. Uh, Rich Earn. What was his name? I wrote about him. Uh, Air, you know, the, uh, he was a rookie at that time. Uh, well, let me give you the list of this year. There were the true running backs that have carried the football: James Conner, Benny Snell, Jalen Samuels, Trey Edmonds, Tony Brooks, James, and Kareth White Jr. You want to take a stab at how many guys in '89 there were? There were seven of them that year. At least based on what I can find, these were true running backs. Well, Mer- like Merrill Hodge is one of them, right? Yeah, you got Merrill Hodge. Yep. Was I'm trying to remember? Was Abercrombie there? No, not Walter. No, no Walter. Uh, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I Rich, know. Rich Aaron, Aaron, was Rich Ehrenberg there? Mm, you're close. So there's a couple guys with the first name R, but no, not not Rich. Yeah, Literally yeah. I'm, 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 I'm. All right, I'll, I'll read the list off. Merrill Hodge, Tim Worley. He was a true okay, running back, okay, right? Okay, Worley, 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 okay. Yeah. Warren Williams. Rodney Ooh, Carter, name. yeah, Rodney Carter, uh, Ray Wallace, and I think this guy had one carry. Tim Tyrell, yeah, that that's by real obscure yeah, I'm one. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm drawing a blank on two of those. I think I only reason. have six listed. There might be a seventh. I'm not. I'll have to check. But either way, that's six. So long time they've had a backfield with this much turnover. Wow. Okay, that's an interesting nugget. I have to go back now and watch a couple of those obscure carries. <laughs> Thank, thanks so that, much. That is in the stats of the weird. Uh, also, the Steelers have now beaten the Bengals in ten straight games. It's the second long, uh, second longest win streak against any one opponent in Steelers history. Only one longer was the Browns, uh, twelve games from oh three to oh nine. So, it's had the Bengals number for sure. And uh, based on the state of the franchises, Steelers probably can keep that streak going next year when they get number seven back. Yep, you would hope so. Okay, what else uh, offensively from that game? Still not, still thinking that you could probably use uh, uh, Vance McDonald a little bit more uh, uh, than you use. You know, I, I think you already hit on on Kareth White. And here's the thing: the two guys, uh, the two guys that you you brought in last Saturday in White and Kane contributed uh, and contributed quite well. Uh, you had uh, you had White had. Uh, how many how many yards did he have on that second drive? Was it fifty? Did he have fifty yards on that drive? Forty forty three or something like like that. And then uh, Kane, he only had the one reception for the thirty five yards, but he also drew a uh, uh, pass interference penalty in that game against B W Webb as as well. So mm-hmm. you know the the old, the old hidden yardage thing. You know, uh, was was definitely in play uh, uh, yesterday against the Bengals there. So here, uh, I don't know how much time we got here. I'm sure we have as much as we want. But uh, <laughs> uh, I was trying to go back a few few nights ago. What was it? Friday night there. Uh, and remember how much I knew about Dion Kane. I was kind of drawing a blank. So you know what I did? I went and oh, charted, God. I went and charted every damn target that he had. Uh, thankfully, every every game. Uh, for Clemson for the last three or four years is up on the YouTube machine. Uh, but I went and charted every target that he had, 90-something targets, uh, his his final season there. I kind of remembered him more as as as, as kind of, you know, a deep guy, but but uh, that what, you know, it's definitely, 
not him. He's more in 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 the mold of kind of I don't know a, a, a poor man Sammy Watkins or or along those lines. There, he had Alex. Man, he only had three three deep ball catches of more than. Well, let me read off the stats here here to you. I was surprised by this because I remembered him uh, being I, I thought being more of a deep ball catcher. Uh, do you remember studying him much? No, I didn't really look at him a whole lot, but I know in Pittsburgh, at least, they're going to look at him as that vertical threat, that one-on-one guy. That's how he caught his 35-yard reception yesterday. He's just doing what Johnny Holton couldn't do. He's going to be that vertical threat when you have that size, frame, you know, speed, you know, the triangle numbers. I think that that's what makes him attractive. Plus, it's easier to pick up the playbook when you're just told to run a lot of go routes. All right. Yeah. I mean, I look, I mean, I, you know, I made the joke that his route tree was going to be a stick. <laughs> right. Yeah, and yeah. and that's pretty much what it was yesterday. Uh, however, uh, 92 pass targets during his final year at Clemson and his average completed air yards was just 8.7 yards and his average intended air yards was 12.6 yards. He only had five, uh, five catches of more than 15 yards past the line of scrimmage on 21 total deep pass targets. So, uh, I, you know, what's, what's, 21 of 92 i mean that's not even 33 percent right that's about 30 percent isn't it about 23 percent all right so 20 only 23 percent of his now i didn't go back into 2016 or 2015 uh to to see if he was used different uh you know differently in those years but you usually those guys kind of stay you know how, how they're used but uh, i i found that to be a lot different than what I think that I thought that I thought uh, as far as his deep ball uses. Only only 21 target deep pass targets past 15 yards, and he only had five. Now, he ran a lot of out routes, man. Those 7 to 12, you know, uh, uh, outs. He didn't play any in a slot, really, so he's an outside guy, but they moved him to, I, I think, you know, both the Z uh, and, and, and the X in that offense there at Clemson. But a lot of it working outside the numbers with him. A lot of balls caught along the sideline. He had six total drops. Now, are the Steelers going to – one thing was for sure. Now, he can he can get downfield. So, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see if that's mostly how he's used. But but make no mistake about it, he was, he was, more, he was used as a possession receiver too uh, within – you know, within 10 yards of the line of scrimmage. So that that's an asset of his game that potentially might be used with him. But I, I found it interesting. It was a little bit from what I remember to what he actually did on the field uh, in 2017 in Clemson was a little bit different than, than I think what I remember. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's good information. But I know in Pittsburgh, at least he's going to be used as that vertical threat. And if he can make some plays downfield and James Washington make plays downfield, and obviously that great run after catch, which is definitely worthy of talking about. And I think Washington said post game was trying to channel his inner Vance McDonald and uh, poor B.W. Webb, former Steeler. Uh, not a great game for him yesterday and uh, finished that playoff. So, yeah. Hard to um, believe that guy's still in the NFL as a quarterback. Right? Yeah. It's like him and Ross Cockle. I'm going, well, this guy's still in the league. Awesome. Good I for think them. Ro- I think Ross is better. I think Ross yeah. is uh, twice better the play. cornerback that, uh, that B.W. Webb is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, what year was Webb a Steeler? Four four years ago or something? It's been a while. So anyway, but yeah, you made the play. You, you got in the end zone and, and you needed a big play like that. So, so kudos to Washington. He's playing the best football. This last month has been, and I know it's only going into his second year, so it's not a whole lot of competition, but this last month has been his best football by far. Yeah, 90, uh, 90 something yards yesterday was, uh, mm-hmm. was a career high for him. Of course, careers hadn't been. But, but you know, he's doing a lot of things now that, that you saw – you saw on the tape at, 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 at Oklahoma State. So, you know, that that's the positive there. And, you know, he should continue to be able to do some of those things. He really bended that uh, that, that post out, you know. And, and mm-hmm. like I said, I had to see what, what the All-22 says, see if it was cover three or, or, or an inverted cover two. But he found a perfect hole uh, in that, with, you know, after bending that thing out and then back into the middle of the field and then – you catch the ball at the forty nine yard line. Uh that's that's a lot of yak. Yeah, that was. Uh, that was a great run after catch. Twenty fourteen for BW up. He's still only twenty nine years old. Thought he was older than that, so He's still hanging around in the league. Anything else from the offense, Dave, you wanted to touch on? Deontay Johnson, though, the stats, uh, the box score isn't very pretty, but I thought he did a nice job to separate, make some plays on third down, and uh, hopefully get Juju back next week. 
Yeah, and that that'll be key too. If they, uh, it'd be nice if they can get Juju back. Uh, how did anybody have forgot to look here? Uh, you're gonna see box scores. What receiving box scores looking, or at least hopefully looking uh, more and more like. You know, when Juju comes back and all like that, are you going to see guys that catch? And that's why I made it one of the the uh, the five questions this week. Will any one player have what? I, what I go with four or five? Uh, uh-huh. uh, you know. Are you going to have in any given week one player with four or more receptions? <laughs> you know, uh, probably not. I mean, you know, th- those kind of games are going to be few and far between with the way the defenses are going to probably have to uh, try to defend these guys. But once again, you can't discount the hidden yardage in there uh, for, for Deion Kane, you know, on one of those deep pass interference penalties there as well, too. So right. uh, Johnny Holton. You know, those 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 reps are going to get fewer and far between for him. Yeah, which is the way it should be for sure. Um, but the, the other question is, will there be another 100 yard receiver this year? They've only had one all season long. Juju, I think, went for 105 against the Dolphins. Uh, they're one of only three teams. I think NFL to only have one 100 yard game from receiver this year. Washington got so close. But, hey, they keep making plays like that. I don't care too much about the particular numbers. Just, uh, you know, do more than what they've done already this year look what you the way this defense is playing right now just don't turn the damn football over you know mm-hmm. yeah. uh punt punts are okay especially the way barry's punting right now and maximize your possessions when you get them uh near midfield or or in in the plus plus territory right there uh this is the don't 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 screw anything up you know <laughs> Uh, kind kind of the 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 a red foreman offense, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> hey, I like uh, uh, Deion Kane ten snaps yesterday. Alex uh, Johnny Holton sixteen snaps. Uh, Kareth White seven snaps. So he touched the football what six times out of seven snaps? Is mm-hmm. that right? Yeah, six carries. Yeah, the second leading rusher for the Steelers yesterday was Kareth White. The second leading receiver for yesterday was Deion Kane. So two guys have plucked off someone else's practice squad comes in and. Makes an impact right away. And they played the lowest amount of snaps on offense, <laughs> both those two. So, just, hey, just like hey, we all thought. Hey, look, yo, t- you got to take your hat off and hand it to them, you know? That, absolutely. Uh, with a quick overview for the offensive line, you know, better. The cash row, that was the, probably the best lineman. Villanueva can, struggles have continued. It's been a rough two weeks for Villanueva. Any other thoughts with the O-line? Finney seemed to do well. I really like no bobble exchanges. I mean, some Finney was firing some fastballs into Hodges. Hodges didn't look super comfortable trying to, to, to catch him uh, early in that game. But overall, no major mistakes, and I'm happy with that. Uh, the first two snaps to Hodges, he bobbled. Yeah, I don't know if that was a Finney issue or a Hodges issue or what, but. You know, the least disaster was avoided. I did. I did. I, I got to admit, I haven't gone through with a fine tooth yeah. comb on Finney yet. Uh, the the one thing that I will say on that last sack uh, with Villanueva once again is you got to help. And when you and I, I think I've talked about this recently, too. you got to help protect your tackles a little bit. Mm hmm. Yeah, by, by not getting too deep in the pocket. I have to go back and look at it. I, I thought that was on Villanueva, but you're making a good point about Hodges. I'll have to check it. But either way, I thought Villanueva did not have a uh, sparkling game yesterday. Right. Now, look, I mean, what, was, was it a crystal clean game by Al? No. But uh, you stand back there at, at 11 yards past the line of scrimmage, you're begging to get beat around the end. You know, he had him. He had him kind of push, try, trying to push around the arc, and it seemed like there was there was uh, you know three yards, two and a half yards that 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 Hodges could have stepped up into mm-hmm. the pocket there. So go back and look look at that one uh, a little bit closer there. Uh, overall, yeah, I mean, uh, look, you run for what they ran for on the offense, you know, in the offense, and one of the sacks was Hodges essentially running himself out of real estate over to the right uh, there. So n- no issues there. They just got to start burying the football more offensively on uh, when they get half fields. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah, yeah. I'm not expecting this offense to drive, even with Hodges, I'm not expecting this offense to have the 70-something yard play, uh, you know, uh, 40-something yards after the catch kind of thing. Will they get a couple of those going forward? Yeah, you hope so. But, I, you know, I don't I, – I, I don't know where you are as far as is what you think this offense can do. I'm not expecting to see a lot of 75 yard drives. <laughs> I am with you. Right, but but what you can do is you can start burying these midfield or these <clears throat> these 60 yard 
uh, fields. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, at the very least, you know, it was brutal. That, that interception by Rudolph was brutal because they moved yep. the football on that drive. Yep, the one good drive Rudolph led ends in a pick. So those those in a fragile offense, you just cannot have. So mm-hmm. if they start burying one or one other drive, maybe, and get up into that that twenty one to twenty three point range, that might be enough, you know. But the way the defense is playing, absolutely. The two the two other numbers that they have to get better at third down. I mean, they were better in short yardage, which is a positive sign. But they were five of sixteen overall on third down yesterday. That's unacceptable, and the red zone offense 0 for 4 yesterday. They are now the 31st ranked red zone offense at 35.7%. Only Washington is worse, and again, I know that no Ben changes the equation mightily, but this was the number one red zone offense last year at 73%. Now they're next to last in the NFL. you got to be able to convert on your chances when you get down there. I know two of those fails came with Rudolph. Did uh, was was three with Rudolph and one with Hodges, or was it two and two? I know there were at least two with Rudolph. The pick, the third down miss, Tevin Jones resulted in the field goal. Uh, I don't know if they're counting the final drive, which was in the red zone when they took the knee uh, as a red zone fail. They might be, so there might be a little technicality there. I'd have to go back and check though. Okay. But either way, they've been bad all year at the 31st, and that's not just because of the, the final red zone attempt uh, on Sunday. So got to get better there. Got to be able to capitalize on the few chances your offense gets. Okay, Dave, let's flip to the defense now. And really, it was just more of the same. I don't have a whole lot new to say here, but it was just a defense played well throughout, and the thing that clinched it for them, and we talked about that in the Browns game where they didn't get those plays, but they got those plays late on Sunday, was creating turnovers at Devin Bush force fumble might have saved the game, and it might have saved the season if you go back and look at this thing uh, by the end of the year. Yeah, they needed that one more play, didn't they? Well, mm-hmm. and they actually got two more, uh, as it turned out. But uh, uh, they needed that one play. This is a defense that, unfortunately, gave up some chunks again. Uh, Boyd made some – that Boyd's a great uh, 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 great wide receiver. If they if they surround him with, with a little bit of help, you know, kind, kind of moving forward there. That one he caught off of his bicep. Uh, uh, was incredible. Now, obviously, Ed- Edmonds really didn't contest much of that, you know, uh, whatsoever. But uh, if they can eliminate that that occasional chunk here and there, you know, but uh, they they got him for a couple of chunks. They settled down. though. I thought they played a run reasonably well. I mean, look, Joe Joe Mixon's a great back. He's gonna make he's gonna make some stuff happen for him, and he did uh, in that game. Uh. But uh, and it, what, it was the run defense was good early. Then it kind of waned, and and I wanted to see them finish better than you know, I want to see. I wanted to see them finish the way that they started that thing. Right, uh, and look, even on the on 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 the play by Bush, uh, that was kind of a will, if you a, a will, if you will, of sorts that they that he kind of picked up because there wasn't a lot in the. Uh, I think it was a two man route. Mm-hmm. I, I think only two men two men out in routes uh, on that, but oh, yeah. because, because they used uh, max protection on that as well too, and there are a lot of there are a lot of Steelers on the other side at defense uh, uh, on one guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then you know you single up Bush uh, in that situation, so it was a great from a, a scheme aspect to single up Boyd on Bush and have him run uh, kind of a you know an up and and and, and an over and out on him and give up to play but Bush you know to his credit he stuck with it and he punched that football out and that ball magnet was right I'm surprised that football just didn't hop right up into the <laughs> arms of of, uh, of Mika Fat, Fit, Fitzpatrick but boy he always seems to oh looky there I bet he finds <laughs> a lot of hundred dollar bills he, he, he's that guy that, that walks down the street and that hundred dollar bill lays at his, at right. his feet right we need to hang out with Mika Fitzpatrick I need some of that good luck and he just picks that thing up and twinkle toes it for. I thought he stepped out, but uh, but the replay shows he didn't. He uh, mm. he stayed in, got a nice long return off of that as well too. So uh, uh, yeah, you know, look, uh, you got to you got to continue to play through the play, and and Bush did, and uh, it paid off. Yeah, my favorite part is when Tomlin's asked about Minka, and Tomlin always loves to say, we, we gave him a first for him, you better produce. Like, I think that Tomlin misses that first-round pick in one sense, but, but you know, obviously loves the contributions that Minka's given this team. And then Bud Dupree to close it out with that strip sack fumble. You know, Dupree was talking about how they him and TJ missed uh, sacks in the first half because they've been so ball-focused, you know, trying to strip the, the football out, knowing that this defense has to make big plays to pick up their offense. But you get the one crucial one late in the game. And so I thought Dupree, you know, was – 
so close throughout that entire game and then made the big play late. Uh, here's here here's a stat for you with uh, with with Bush and Minka from the Steelers PR department. The Steelers have 28 turnovers this season. Bush has been in on seven of them. He has four fumble recoveries, two interceptions, and Sunday's huge forced fumble. Fitzpatrick in two fewer games has been even more productive. He has five interceptions, a forced fumble, and two fumble recoveries. So those guys wow. uh, those guys t- together make that football jump around out there yeah yeah the and infusion then you, then you throw in tj watt and he's got like what five forced fumbles uh after having like what do you have six last year i think and, so and uh bud ripping the ball out this year so yeah it it you know uh uh needless to say we've hit your we've hit your your 25 takeaway mark right mm-hmm. yeah 28 for the year um they're gonna have probably one of their best numbers in in, in quite some time but yeah the infusion of playmakers devin bush Mika Fitzpatrick, um, Stephen Nelson's playing just really solid football. I went back to my charting yesterday, and well, Nelson hasn't made really the splash play this year. He doesn't have an intercept- interception yet. Um, the guy is just consistently just playing tight man coverage and making life difficult on quarterbacks when they when they target his side. Yeah, that's positive. Joe Hayden probably didn't have the best of game, especially in the first, let's say, I don't know, 45 minutes. But uh, I thought he had a couple, uh, couple okay, I think, breakups there l- later in the game and all like that. Uh, look, I mean, if Russian coverage goes hand in hand. You can, mm-hmm. you can get away with not having great man to man guys if you're putting pressure on the quarterback and we're seeing the Steelers do that consistent consistently week in week out you just knew that 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 TJ Watt versus Bobby Hart is, is something that's not going to go well for for the Bengals and we mm-hmm. said that before the game uh TJ got a uh, kind of a speed to rip on him and you know Finley, they they did a you know they did a relatively good job keeping Finley in the pocket too, and that was one thing kind of talked ahead of this game about right. was was Finley's mobility uh, and all. But uh, they were able to tee off on him more as as, as the game went on. Uh, not a good game for I thought Cam Hayward uh, in, in this one as well too. Not a sack guy, but he got him another sack. <laughs> but your uh, Ohio State on Ohio State crime. Ooh, yeah, highlighting. Yeah. Uh, and they were supposedly supposed to get that guard back, but he right. had a, a pregame pregame injury or whatnot as well too. So that that didn't go their way right from even before kickoff. When, but look, you know, you keep getting good good pressure on the quarterback. Uh, T.J. Watt suffered a bone bruise in that game. I thought I thought it was more maybe right knee, uh, but uh, hitting somebody there, and he went out for a couple plays and came back. So thank thank you Jesus there. Uh, but right <laughs> right 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 now, uh, the, the you know this front continues to get good pressure and the strength of this team is your defense. Right now they've got a 5.1 adjusted net yards per passing attempt number after 11 games, and that's more than good enough to to compete if you can get a little bit, another notch or two better play from your offense. Yeah, absolutely. I thought the pass rush did wane a little bit in the second half, but it made the big play late. And, and yeah, Russian coverage certainly do go together. You know, we talked about on his you know, game clinching strip sack fumble that the the cover did a great job to force Finley to hold on to the football, and as opposed to you know the Edmonds uh, or the Tyler Boyd catch on Terrell Edmonds, which was a terrible ball skills play by Edmonds, sure, but they sent the pressure on that play, couldn't get home, Bengals will max protect and let Finley have all day in the pocket to be able to fire that one off. So you just see on those two plays very clearly, you know, the, the positives of whenever your rushing coverage go together and the negatives whenever your rush doesn't get home. So want to see a little bit more consistency, but they got the big splash. You still end up with four sacks and the big play late, which, again, this defense has to play better than just well. They have to play better than just a points aspect. They have to create turnovers. They have to create big plays. They did. That's what ultimately got them to win on Sunday. Yeah, I think that's a good point. It's more than just holding them to 17 points. Yep that's not good enough. You got to be able to create big plays too, which is unfortunate, but that's the reality of the situation. Right. Cause once again, I, you know, I, you know, even with, 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 uh, superhero duck Hodges in here, uh, I'm not expecting them to hope, hopefully he proves me wrong, but I'm not, I'm still not, I'm not, I'm still not, uh, positive. This offense can drive 75 yards. Yeah. No, even with Hodges, they're going to struggle. I mean, this offense is going to be just a work in progress and just just trying to do its very best, keep its head above water uh, for the entire rest of the season, regardless of who's a quarterback. So you just hope the defense continues to play at the level that it does, and it needs to. 
because uh, this playoff race is getting really, really interesting day with Oakland and Buffalo and the Titans now, you know, uh, reemerging and Cleveland now trying to throw their hat in the ring. Uh, there is very little margin for error the rest of the season. Yeah, uh, you can maybe lose one more game, but who do you lose it to? <laughs> Arizona? Yeah. yeah, that might be it. Uh, I mean, th- that that's it. You know, uh, we'll, we'll see. At, at this point, do you want Baltimore to continue winning? So, uh, I mean, even so, they're still probably, you know, I don't think you can do that for the sheer fact that people say, well, they'll get into that last game and have to sit some people. They still might be playing for that top seed mm-hmm. with, uh, New w- with with New England there. So Yeah, uh, but I would I, prefer them. Do you still prefer them to win, though, and just hope that – it doesn't end up mattering. I can't prefer Bob Baltimore. Yeah. There's not a bone in my body left. That it, it takes all I can do to to mm-hmm. root for them when it helps the Steelers sometimes in the in the, in the standings. So no, I it, 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 every fiber in my body uh, makes me want to vomit when I have to do that. <laughs> but uh, uh, no, I no, I, I I think you still got an outside chance if they run into this rough patch here because I mean. We don't expect them to, but I mean, what happens if they lose? I mean, you going out. If there's ever a recipe for them to lose, it's tonight. Yeah, against the Rams. I mean, you, you I guess you root for them to lose tonight, and if not, then you might just root for them to, to run the table and and hopefully have to you know, be in the position to bench some guys for Week 17. Well, uh, who who do they uh, who do they have left here? Don't they have uh, Buffalo still on the schedule or no? I uh, only pull up their schedule. Uh, they have. San, they they got the Rams, the 49ers, and the Bills all, yeah. all, all you know all in these. So if there's ever a time for them to maybe you know fall on hard times, it's now. Mm-hmm. And they do play Cleveland at Cleveland, which team to beat them this year pretty handily. Uh, so yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see what happens. We'll take it tonight. But again, I I, I spend I, I know you do as well. I, I spend very little time thinking about Baltimore when you're Pittsburgh and you're just trying to survive and advance to the next week. Right and. You know, you you own the tiebreakers right now over over, oh, I mean over uh uh the Colts. So you're not to me, you're not really scoreboard watching them. You mm-hmm. know, at, at at this point, Oakland is obviously in this thing. Tennessee, as long as you win, Tennessee shouldn't be worrisome to you either, and and really anybody behind them. So it's really, to me, it's Buffalo, Oakland, uh in 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 Indianapolis, and the, and and the Steelers fighting for two spots. You know. Right. And the Steelers own, I guess, tiebreaker over everybody right now because they're the sixth seed besides Buffalo. Obviously, I don't know if that changes based on what happens the rest of the way. Well, I think that's... conference record right now, okay. the, the Steelers are five and three uh, right now. So obviously, look at me if you get but you get Buffalo in a couple weeks, so you can own that head to head. Right uh, there, uh, Buffalo already has six wins though, so. You know, mm-hmm. the, you know, are, are you going to be root, who are you going to be rooting for in that Buffalo Wait, that's Baltimore six, six game? Six conference wins? Is that what you're saying? No, they have uh, 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 yeah, six conference wins. Six okay, okay they're, eight, they're eight and three overall. Yeah. Right, and they already they have got... eight eight total wins there. So you got to think if they get two more wins, somehow, some way, ten wins is going to get you uh, in this thing. Mm-hmm. You know? But they do have Dallas, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, New England, and the Jets to finish out their schedule. Sure. So a very tough schedule for the Bills going forward. But anyway, yeah, just just beat Cleveland, and then you can have these conversations going forward. Uh, that nothing else matters if you if you don't beat the Browns on Sunday. All right, Dave, anything else from the defense you wanted to touch on? Uh, just would like to see him shore up a little bit more on some of these big plays down the field. You know, Edmonds, you know, his, his athleticism, his numbers will show up in – Areas that are kind of him running straight lines, you know, mm-hmm. you don't see him be able to kind of leap and and make some of these other other plays that you would wish, you know, he'd be able to make on occasion. Just no ball skills. I mean, the guy can't play the ball in the air. That's why he only has one career interception, which came on a bad overthrow last year. And what did Mark Barron do yesterday? Uh, played he, a lot. he played a lot. And didn't that look like he got robbed of safety there? No, I thought it was a good call. Finley was okay. outside the uh, the goal line. I wish it was a safety. It was close. But uh, how many snaps did Vince play yesterday? It was not many. Less than 10, probably. Uh, Vince, snap count on that. Uh, yeah, Vince played uh, nine snaps. Yeah, they they didn't play any base. The, the, the Bengals played almost exclusively in 11 personnel. Seagulls had like one or two snaps in their, in their base 3-4. So there you go. Barron played 54. Five ninety-five percent of the snaps. Uh, Bush played thirty-six, sixty-two percent of the snaps. 
Yeah, because Barron's still the dime defender. Keith Butler still wants Barron out there. And I and I understand the Bush has had his struggles in coverage, and being a good athlete doesn't mean you're a great cover guy. But, man, Bush has got to be the answer going forward. There was actually one play. I'm going to post to the, the uh, gif of it right after we, we're done with the podcast. Where Remember the play where Hayden broke up the throat, I believe, Auden Tate on the right sideline uh, in the late in the fourth quarter? Right. Uh, Bush actually did a great job of communicating that one and getting because initially Hayden had lined up on the running back that mo- well the running back motioned out wide Hayden stayed on him and so Bush came out and told basically Hayden get on the receiver I'm gonna take the running back let's man it up that way so Bush put them in a really good matchup so you're seeing this guy be able to communicate make good decisions being able to process and make big plays and coverage yes there's still some things to work on but he's a better option than Mark Barron who's just really struggling and all aspects of coverage and and so i think i take the training wheels off of Devin bush let him be the every down kind of guy yeah keith butler talked a little bit about that this past week about him you know uh look he's going to be he's going to be the guy at some point to 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 be that guy uh in fact here it goes Devin bush hasn't been on the field as much in the last few games why is that is it a coverage I- issue he says it wasn't a cover issue at all we wanted to try and get mark Barron on the field a little bit and play play some coverage we have a couple of different personnel groups we use mark has been healthy for us we are using uh, them a little bit more. We use all of them. Uh, we use all three of them in Vince and May uh, and May. What was that saying? May man 55 Devin. Uh, nothing against him. He has done a good job for us. Coverage issues with ins for any inside linebackers, but especially young ones. Keith Butler was asked on on Thursday. You always have coverage issues in terms of matchups. They are going to pro. Uh, they are going to probably match up 85. Tyler Eifert uh, here. <laughs> Good, 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 not, good, good. Yeah. Should we go there? <laughs> no, nope, let's not touch that one. <laughs> he has uh, he has done a good job of catching the ball. There's a lot of stuff going on right now. We're just trying to make sure uh, they don't know who we have out there and who is covering who. Well, uh, Keith, these guys have uniform numbers on them, you know. So, mm. uh, uh, like you identify players by numbers, they can do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, and again, Barron might might be the older guy, the more experienced guy, but you, if you're a bad athlete, you're in actual trouble covering. So you need the good the good athlete as opposed to the the marginal one out there. But anyway, I just thought Bush played well. I'll I'll post that clip. You'll see it on my timeline if you're listening to the podcast. Um, so that that was a pretty pretty important play that led to a, a, a obviously positive result. Last thing I, I want to talk about the defense. T.J. Watt, you know, I, I saw Burt Lawton, and, and granted he's the Steelers guy, but I think he makes a good case for T.J. Watt, T.J. Watt being in the running for Defensive Player of the Year. Is that fair to say? Oh, yeah. I mean, the guy just has uh, been dominant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, he is he is a nightmare for uh, for right <clears throat> for right tackles right now. He's so good with uh, uh, with his hand usage, with uh, his 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 counters, his athleticism, uh, using that rip move from that side. But that that you know, you want to talk about an underrated move, moving moving him from the uh, from the right to the left side. Uh, where he's staring the quarterbacks, most quarterbacks right in the face there has really been a, a positive when it comes to him. He's He has been on fire this year. 31 and a half career sacks through the first, since 2000, of, of, of players through their first three years, the only ones who currently have more than T.J. Watts, 31 and a half sacks are Alden Smith, Dwight Freeney, Sean Merriman, J.J. Watt, Vaughn Miller, Robert Quinn, and Demarcus Ware. And obviously Watt can and likely will add to that list going forward. So that is elite company. And to me, Watt has become an elite and a complete player. You know, the, the thing is, when you go back, I remember watching a lot of his, you know, uh, after drafted, of course, uh, looking at a lot of his film. He had the hand usage and all, but he just was not a refined pass rusher. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, well, he, was, he made the switch in college and he had a lot of work to do. Right. And uh, he... Uh, the, the raw, the raw traits were there, but, uh, uh, you know, there weren't, there weren't a lot of those higher quality wins, if you will, you know, uh, uh, when you look at a sack reel from, from Wisconsin, uh, there, uh, a few of them, but you know, the, and that's why I think he fell as far as he did, you know, uh, heck right. there, there was some mention that he going to fall into the middle of the second round. You know, and and that was mm. to me. I I thought that was kind of. I thought it was conceivable at the time. Yeah, I remember pegging the Steelers to Watts. I don't remember anything about him going beyond there. But I just every time I tweet something positive about T.J. Watt and everything I tweet about Watt, it's basically positive. I get Packers and Cowboys and Falcons fans, and my mentions mad that they didn't take him because he's been a special, special player. Uh, but he has. He's continued to progress every every year. You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
you know, I don't know if he'll win, you know, defensive player of the year, but he should, he should be in the runner for it. Yep. Absolutely. Should be in the conversation. All right, Dave, uh, special teams. I thought special teams were a huge component of yesterday's win. When you're in a low scoring game, when you're in a field position game for much of that one, um, you have to be able to be strong on special teams. The Bengals actually have a great special teams unit overall, but whether you're talking Chris Boswell, who was three for three on field goals, including a 47 yarder, uh, whether you're talking Jordan Berry with 45 something average punt and a one punt that was a 60 yard net, which is excellent, a season eye for him. Whether you're talking the kick coverage unit, which really shut down Brandon Wilson, their dangerous return guy. Uh, the kick return game still sucks, but what are you going to do? Three out of four ain't, ain't, ain't bad, but I thought special teams was, was a really big component in yesterday's victory. Uh, not so much impressed with the return team still, but, uh, boy, uh, Jordan Berry's, uh, uh, played real well. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, and Boswell obviously making all of his kicks certainly does, uh, uh, help as well too. So that, that's, that's the biggest thing that has stuck out to me with the special teams. Yeah. And then some specific names in the coverage unit, Johnny Holton, I thought played great. They were trying to double Holton and he was still making plays. Justin Lane had a big tackle. I might, you know, Justin, Justin Lane's not looking bad as a gunner. Artie Burns has missed a million tackles as a gunner this year. So I don't know if you make a change there. If you do, you think about that one a little bit more. I know Burns has value for being a backup cornerback. Ola with a forced fumble. He's got, what, two of them this year. And Robert Splain, I think, had four tackles yesterday on special teams. I think it's what the box score said. So that's awesome for him. Yeah, co- coverage units, uh, uh, Lane did stick out, I remember, on one of them. Seemed like uh, another one. Didn't Ola just miss on having uh, another one? Didn't he let let one out of his, uh, 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 just out of his arms on, on, on one of those I, tackles that, that yeah, kind of had him pinned I think, back? I th- yeah, I think Holton had a chance for a, a real big tackle, but still uh, they got him wrapped up. But, yeah, Ola's got two force. I mean, the force fumble on the opening kickoff of the game. Steelers almost recovered that one. So good job there. Although Ola, the way he tackles, sometimes does scare me. He's got to keep his eyes up because uh, that could be dangerous. Yeah. Uh, look, they got to get better on return game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, they need to. I just have no hope that it's going to happen this year. I just don't see it changing. So Gareth White, uh, I know he's not, I know he's new to this group, but if you, if you feel the ball in the end zone, my friend, just take a knee. It's going to be the better thing for you for, for, uh, this, this, this offense. Just All right, Dave. Just don't turn the damn ball over in that phase. Yeah. Also, Dion Day Johnson scares me very, very much as a punt returner. Uh, I know. I, I wrote, punt. I wrote about that right from the get go with him. You just, you kind of look, he can break them. I mean, mm-hmm. it's probably not going to be surprising if he breaks one at some point, but the uh, the the waiting for that man he just uh, the decision making and the bobbling and what that that just scares me I, you know as as much as he might break one you're probably gonna put one on the ground as well <laughs> right question is which comes first which is the very scary part yeah his, his technique his posture getting it getting square getting under the football and punts is abysmal man that one he had before the half yesterday where he dove out for it. Dude, let that one bounce. Your offense isn't doing any. You're taking a knee no matter what happens. Uh, why are you diving out for that one and risking a fumble? That could have been just a monumental, colossal disaster. So a lot of work to do. So, And, and I know that he's more dynamic, but that is why pe- the team liked Ryan Switzer because he was always in great position to field the punt. You know, I had never had any concern about Switzer to field anything incorrectly or risking a fumble or a bobble uh, initially. Johnson, I'm holding my breath every time it's back there. Look, why the, what the heck's wrong with Cameron Sutton at this point, man? You well, know? Sutton could have similar issues, and Tomlin just doesn't like defensive players. He doesn't trust them to have good ball security. I, I understand that, but uh, I don't remember him fumbling way back when I looked at his punt return take coming out of Tennessee, yeah. and he was, uh, he was a nation leader uh, at one point, you know, I think, in, in one of those years there. So, damn. You know, might want to think about giving him an opportunity or two. Mm-hmm. I hear you. Just, just I need someone that I can trust back there, and I'm sketchy on that situation. But overall, special teams I thought did their job yesterday, and and, and Barry and Boswell are having excellent seasons. Look, you came up, you came out of there with uh with with a W. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it was it wasn't pretty. You know, uh, uh, you're not going to turn a lot of heads with 16 to 10 games, but. Uh, nope. You know, as long as you get the, uh, on the 16 side of them, you know that that's all that matters here. Look, you, you get uh, you get Cleveland in a in a in a game that you know the Steelers have circled right now. If you guys on on the Steelers have circled because of the way things went down there in in that game in Cleveland there, so this is going to be a motivated bunch, and there's a lot riding on you could have you could effectively end the Brown season uh, on on Sunday in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I know, to, and this is just one man's opinion, but Tony Dungy said whoever wins Sunday's game between Pittsburgh and Cleveland is going to take a wild card spot. I mean, I understand where he's coming from. I, I mean, I, there, there's a lot that can happen in between there, though. Sure. Because, yeah, I'm not I saying mean, that. Even if, even if Cleveland wins, they got to – they, mm-hmm. they don't. They don't have the easiest, and they're a game behind. You know, yeah. so they don't have the easiest schedule on top of it. So that sounds that sounds great. I think on TV, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not locking the Steelers in just because they sure. win this game. But if, if anything, I'm putting Cleveland out of it. Uh, and I'm you know, I'm not putting Pittsburgh out if they lose this game either. But boy, you better run the table after that. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, I'm not saying I agree with Dungey. I just thought you know. They just stressing the importance of, of how much this game's going to mean to both teams. So, any other thoughts from yesterday, Dave? I know we're going to go through the all twenty two and really kind of get our teeth into this thing for Wednesday's show. But uh, yeah, get the win. I don't care how you do. I said it yesterday. By any means necessary, whatever you got to do to get the victory, you got to do. Yeah, uh, continue to play good defense, and you know, s- s- uh, just don't turn the ball over on offense. And uh, like I said, you got to you got to bury one extra of those possessions that you get in plus territory. And if they can do that, and you know, I think they might be okay here. I agree. All right, Dave, let's uh, talk about our friends over at my bookie. I know I don't think I had good, a, a good week with my picks. We'll have to see what the numbers look like. I know my fantasy football team is hurting as well this week, but uh, tell us about our friends over at my bookie. I certainly will. Attention, past, present, and future MyBookie players. For this week only, MyBookie is offering a risk-free bet on the Bears, Lions. Thing. I love Thanksgiving, man. Have I told you that before? I, I, is, your, is your favorite holiday? It is. Yeah, I like I, I like Thanksgiving more on my birthday, to be honest with you, <laughs> because it's just so low-key. We usually do the whole honey bake the ham thing we're gonna go uh we've made that our tradition now i think about six or seven years on going now we go over to honey baked ham load up on i think we spend like 150 200 dollars i mean we get ham we get turkey we get all the fixings and sounds like an ad for uh for honey baked ham but man it it makes it easy. we sit around and, and eat on that for like three days straight get a couple of pies on top of it there but there uh go. for this week only my bookie is offering a risk-free bet on the bears lions game simply choose a team against the spread for up to two $250. That's up to $250. If you win, congrats. You've got extra holiday spending money. If you lose, congratulations to you as well. My bookie will give you all your money back. It's a no-brainer because you literally cannot lose. It's no risk, all gravy. It doesn't matter whether you're an experienced player or a first-time customer, my bookie welcomes all to come play, so quit waiting around and get signed up today. Do you find yourself wanting to sports bet but have lots of questions about how to do it? Don't sweat it. My bookie's patient and customer service team can walk you through the process, and the best part is, if you join now, you'll still have one last shot to take advantage of their incredible sign-up offer. Just log on to mybookie.ag, make your first deposit with promo code terrible that's terrible and my bookie will match your deposit dollar for dollar to jump start your bankroll and that's on top of the risk-free bet i just told you about let me repeat that's a guaranteed deposit match and a risk-free bet for this week only so if you're a true football fan you do not want to let this opportunity pass you by you simply can't lose. Make sure you do your part. Support your team this season. T- hop on the gravy train and get on the action with my bookie. You play, you win, you get paid. All right, Dave. Let's get to some reader emails to close out the show. I'm sure we have a lot on Mason versus Duck. You think? <laughs> uh, I bet we have a lot of Mason Rudolph and Duck. Uh, Devil and Hodges question. Hey, here's one from uh, Kane22. Given the fact that the Steers now have two young quarterbacks that are starting games, wouldn't it help to have a dedicated uh, coach for them? Seems like a small price to pay if one of these guys you can take the next step. P.S. Love Alex, but he sure does make me feel old sometimes. He, <laughs> he makes you feel old. Whatever you think he makes me feel sometimes. Uh, I want to feel young. That's my goal here. L- look, you got uh, you got Chris Sims in that room. I mean, Matt Sims. I mean, Matt Sims uh, in, in that room. Uh, along with Randy Feetner, uh, will they will they will they give him the official title after this season? I bet they do. Either mm-hmm. that, or they're moving him to wide receiver coach. <laughs> Sims, you mean? Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, yeah, I, it's the guy that most fans don't know about, and I don't know exactly what the week to week stuff is like. But I've been point taken. Yeah, you would like to have just that that position at least named, just to, to make you feel a little bit better, I guess, about how they operate things, but. 
Uh, Matt Sims does work closely with the quarterbacks, and you know, if he ever does it as well, he's you know, the offensive coordinator and the quarterback are so joined at the hip that you know, regardless of what the title is, Feetner's is working with those guys super closely anyway. But but I understand the, the point of the question. Uh, yeah, I mean, just some people look at that list and think, well, because it's not dedicated. I mean, look, mm. we don't we don't know what happens at practice, you know, but uh, right. I would think those I think that's a very active quarterback room, especially with with Randy's background and all. You know? Yeah, and then Ben comes back next year and then you get more time to look at the young guys to kind of sit and learn. And, and that makes everything better. Uh, let's see here. What do we have? Uh, let's see. Uh, in your stats of the weird, Neil O'Donnell wasn't a rookie in 1981. He was a third round pick in 1990. Oh, do I have that wrong? Shoot. I had, you know, I had so many just stats I was just off on yesterday. Well, oh, well, sorry. Uh, Jim Bendis writes in, I heard Tomlin in the past saying that they keep their own stats Inferring that their stat numbers may or may not match up with NFL stats totals, I assume one of those may be quarterback passer completions where the ball was on target and in the receiver's hands, but the receiver happens to drop the ball for whatever reasons. Same when the ball was fumbled, uh, irregardless who recovers the ball. In your humble opinion, what other stats uh, does the Steelers keep that are different from what the NFL gives? I, I don't have a clue what they keep that might be different. I know sometimes when you look at some of the media uh, released stat sheets from them, they'll they'll differ some from uh, uh, from what the NFL has there. Uh, so uh, do they do they take uh, you know do they credit quarterbacks with receptions on drops or what have you i i don't know uh look i i think the i think we've reached a point with advanced analytics now anyway jim where i think we, we ought to have a lot more uh more official stats to choose from and i think it makes some of these players look better too when it comes contractual time to have uh the and i bet their agents would like a a, a few more official stats if you will you know mm-hmm. so May, you know, look, there, there was a time where sacks wasn't an official stat, right? You know, uh, it's time. I think it's time to progress in some of these areas. I think I think wide receivers should be charged or pass or pass targets should be charged with with interceptions sometimes and quarterbacks not, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, that, that, you know, Jim, I, I don't know what they do different than, than what the NFL does, to be honest with you. Yeah, I have no idea either. Uh, Chris Warren writes in, "Hey guys, I bit my tongue for several games as I was as, as I was determined to give Mason uh, Rudolph a fair shake, and while Mason showed us some good things, I'm just not sure he'll ever get to the point where he can drop back and make decisions quickly enough to be successful. I hope that this is something that improves over time, but it's going to be really tough with limited reps, assuming Duck Duck is is the starter. And how can Duck not be?" Uh, your starter when you're currently the sixth seed, favorable schedule here out. Defense has played its hard out. These guys deserve a chance to make a playoff run, and Duck gives you the best chance to win. Look, I think for the sheer fact alone that that uh, Duck needs to start just for the, sh- uh, the 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 one and only thing being, I you know I don't think you want. Uh, Mason going into this game against the Browns looking over his shoulder. I think that's a recipe for disaster uh, there. As far as how much more Mason will will progress, I mean, he definitely has gone back uh, gone backwards since since uh, since the uh, Rams game. And how many more chances will he get now? So here here's the thing: you still you know people will to go they will go ahead and make a determining. Uh, factor on Mason Rudolph right now, you know, you don't have to, but I mean, if you want to, that's fine. But the, the thing is, is Ben's coming back next year. Uh, that'll be Mason's third season. You know, how much more are you going to learn about Mason from this moment on until maybe through his rookie contract ends, which is in 2021, right? Right, yeah, and you don't know how many more opportunities he's going to have. I mean, if you're the backup next year, naturally you might play a little bit for blowout, you know, win or Ben were to get hurt in mid game or something like that. But sure, he's not going to have the chance ever again, uh, probably, uh, like he does this year. And so you don't know what you're going to know going forward. So I agree. Um, yeah, it, it, this this was the year to figure out what you had and what his makeup was to at least get a pretty good feeling of where his ceiling's at. And unfortunately, these last couple of weeks, especially, have just been. I've been abysmal. That's why I've stated all along. I, I've, I've thought that, you know, 
that that's why you you have them in there because you want to get as many games of an evaluation process done with him uh, while you know that your your starting quarterback, i.e. Ben Roethlisberger, Roethlisberger is going to be out because you obviously uh, are not count you are counting on the next two seasons for Ben to play. You know, thirty of thirty-two games. You mm-hmm. know, right? And, uh, and and the good news is you're finding out early. If you come to the conclusion that he's not going to be the guy, he's not the guy that you that you drafted, then you have a chance to still correct that mistake and bring in somebody new before Ben retires, as opposed to Ben retiring and Rudolph getting in there and having the same outcome. And then you're scrambling with with no really guide towards the future. So in some ways, this is a, a blessing in disguise. Right. I mean, you have to use, and now now you'll have, you know, however many games. Once again, I don't, I have a feeling you haven't seen the last of, of Mason Rudolph this year. And mm-hmm. on the flip side, in the meantime, uh, don't make any hard conclusions on, on Devil and Hodges either. Because, I mean, quite honestly, how many pass attempts has he had? And how, how many has he had that have, that have gone more than 10 yards past the line of scrimmage. You know, it's not a lot. He had mm-hmm. five, uh, he did have the big completion of James Washington yesterday, but, but you know, he only completed five passes in that game. So right. we've still got a lot to learn about that kid as well, too. So, mm-hmm. and he's going to have his struggles and his pitfalls and it's not all going to be sunshine and roses the way that when Ben was struggling and then Ben got hurt, you know, Rudolph was the talk of the town and everyone loves backup quarterback until they make mistakes. Right. I mean, every, right. I mean, what happens if he comes out and he throws two interceptions right at you? Are people going to be hollering for Mason to get back mm-hmm. in there? Right. I mean, you just can't go on a, that's why I said you just can't go on a snap by snap, uh, get him out of there. You know, mm-hmm. uh, type thing. You got to look at the totality on this. And has it been great for Mason? No, uh, no, it hasn't. You know, like I said, he he. You go back, you go back, and you look at his snaps against Seattle right when he came in. Look a lot. You see him kind of maneuver the pocket a lot better, and you just see him kind of uh, uh, grip it, rip it, and go. The more he's had to think about this, the worse he's gotten. Yeah, yeah, that's wow. You said it well. Uh, let's see here. Will Fernandez to, uh, to duck or not to duck. Happy victory Monday, Dave and I short and simple. Will duck Hodges be under center this Sunday versus the Browns? I think he deserves a start. What say you? I think you've, uh, Will, I think you've heard us, us talk on it. I mean, I, I, I hate to keep going back to him. I think just because of who they're playing and, and how, uh, how all this transpired with him and, and with him kind of uh, pressing or whatnot, I think you're setting yourself up. Uh, you can't have Mason go into this game as a starter looking over his shoulder. Yeah, it's, it's less about the opponent for me, the point taken on that and the circumstances surrounding the, the Cleveland game, but just, you know, who's giving you the best chance to win? And I think that's Duck based on the way that, the way that these guys have played. Uh, Nathan Kim writes in, thanks for taking my questions. We've seen the backup perform well multiple times this season when thrown into the fire mid-game. Rudolph thrived when inserted into the Hawks game, Hodges in the Ravens game, etc. This said, how much do you attribute Ducks' positive performance to the Bengals' unfamiliar, unfamiliarity with his play style? Do you expect? Uh, the Browns to be more adequate, uh, more adequately prepared for him and shut him down. Uh, if he, if he ends up starting, I was wondering what you guys thought about Ryan Finley versus Rudolph in terms of overall skill and ceiling comparison. I know both of their sample sizes are quite limited, but I feel like there's been enough opportunities for both of them to make relative judgment on this. I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Let me tell you, if I was, uh, uh, I thought that was going to become a, uh, <laughs> a duck versus Dalton <laughs> g- game. Yes. I think it should have, to be quite honest with you. You know, I am, there was a chance. Uh, Zach Taylor had a chance to, uh, I-, I thought to, uh, to make a change there and put his team in position to win. And I think, uh, I think I would have uh, pulled the plug uh, in, in, in later in the second half and put Dalton in that thing. Yeah. I mean, obviously I, th- I think everyone understands Dalton was the, is the better quarterback than Ryan Finley. It's just, yeah, they they know the season's over. They're not super mad about losing in the sense of obviously they're playing a draft position game and uh, they're they're fine with just letting Finley play and, and kind of riding the season out. They're in a different place than Pittsburgh, where Pittsburgh's in the play your best guy. You got to win. You got to be in the playoff hunt. Uh, do I think Ducks' positive performance in the Bengals unfamiliar? Uh, no, I mean I just I just look. Uh, he only he only completed five passes. I mean let's not. I thought Mike Tomlin framed it great. You know, people will make a little bit more about this than what it is. He deserves he 
he deserves this next game, and then we go from there. You, uh, you know, I don't think I don't think their unfamiliarity with Duck in this uh, in the second half of this game led to what 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 happened. I mean, I think it played an element of it. Anytime you're facing a backup quarterback with limited reps and a, and a different skill set and mentality, but and and I get and I said it earlier, and I'll say it now. I, I get what Tomlin's saying, but let me ask you this: If Mason Rudolph was not benched yesterday, he plays out the whole game. Do the Steelers win? I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, if you had to guess, I I would say no. Do you okay. is that fair? Do you think that's fair? I mean, one play was the difference in that game, quite honestly. So when Tomlin says don't make too much out of it, point taken. But when the difference between that decision is a win and a loss, which to me it is, I'm gonna make a lot out of it because if you didn't play Duck Audrey yesterday, you don't win that game, and your season looks drastically different than today. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna make a deal out of it. Okay, and we'll see if he makes a deal out and starts. Starts deviling against the Browns. Yep. Uh, Mason and Duck. Paul Brown writes in. David Knox, being in Cincinnati and from the hometown of the Bengals fan living. Uh, uh, wait, being in Cincinnati and from the hometown of the Bengals fan living on on their roof. I had a lot of a lot of stake in this game. First, are you starting to become concerned with Big Al at left tackle? I'm not saying. Oh, we need a change, but he hasn't looked good all season. I wouldn't say he hasn't looked good. I mean, he's 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 given up some sacks. Uh, I wouldn't say he's, he's been awful. I've seen him on his butt. Now he had, he was on his butt. Uh, what game was it? Forty Niners. Mm, yeah, Nick Bosa. He he's been on a roller coaster. Had a couple good weeks, a couple bad weeks. Uh, this yesterday was a bad week. Uh, lastly, while I'm impressed, how Duck has a willingness to take a deep shot and concern with him constantly drifting and throwing off his back foot at the first sign of pressure, uh, i.e. fourth quarter, 13-32 remain. He did this uh, multiple times yesterday, and that's just asking for a pick. I'm no expert on this, uh, but it was an observation. I wonder if you agree. Look, if you go back to the game against the Ravens, right? How many interceptable balls did, did Devlin Hodges have in that game, Alex? Two, at least one across the middle. They got Nick wiped out by penalty. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a fair point. And Hodges said the issue that he was probably too antsy and too jittery. And yeah, you, you, you drift in the pocket. It's going to make throws late. It's going to make it harder to pass protect. Uh, it's going to throw your mechanics off. It's going to create a lot of problems. So that, that's a fair point. What I would like to see with him now, uh, I think more so than that, I, I, anything is, okay, we know he can extend plays. Can you step up mm-hmm. in, into the pocket? Okay. Yep. Uh, that way, and additionally, can you make a play outside the pocket? Yeah, I think he's capable of that. He's got the mobility to do it. But has he done now? Now you you talk about has he had kind of uh, 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 signature plays yet? Well, he's had a couple more than Mason Rudolph has. Obviously, the the the, the throw to Washington uh, was one of them, and the throw. Uh, he had one or two, I think, against the Ravens, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the sort of Juju, that uh, fumble was a, was a really nice play by Hodges. Right. I mean, if Juju uh, holds on to that ball, we're probably talking about Steelers maybe one more win, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a couple of uh, – that third down throw, I think, to Deontay Johnson early in the game. Uh, Vince Baltimore, when he's er, – er, earlier for him in the game, but was pretty pretty big. So, well, Go ahead. No, I, I, was, I was rambling. Go ahead. Uh, so here. Sit on your hands, you know, uh, Paul – uh, with this quarterback play going forward, because to me this is still going to be a, a fragile offense, and it's good that they're able to run run the football now. But as 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 out, out and hopefully we're wrong on this, but I I just can't envision many more seventy something yard drives. If they are going to come on some seventy some something yard drives, there's probably going to be a home run play in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, yeah, and there's but- obviously nothing wrong with that, but. Hodges just, just looks more comfortable back there right now. That's what it comes down to. He just feels like he's got more control of the situation than Rudolph, and that's why you play him. Uh, let's see. Kenneth McNair. Hey, Dave, been listening since 2011 to the podcast. Don't really send me questions in, but I love the dynamic of you and Alex, even though I do miss the prior dynamic as well. Not much of a fan of, of the two-hour shows, but I'm supportive regardless, so I'm riding with you guys' questions. If you if you could only give one of these players a contract extension, who are you giving it to, Bud Dupree or Javon Hargrave? The question is, do you trust Bud's output this year versus Hargrave's uh, consistency? Look, it's hard to ignore the way Bud is getting it done now. And Bud plays more snaps uh, than Javon Hargrave. So I guess if, if – if, I mean, it's a tough one. If push comes to shove – uh, if the, you could keep one, I'm um, and and being as how there's really nothing behind 
Bud Dupree, uh, from an experience standpoint, you'd probably like to see him keep Bud. Yeah, no bad answer here. I think Hargrave's still probably pound for pound and a slightly better player, but from a value standpoint, it's probably going to be Dupree. I will say there's like nothing behind Hargrave either in nose tackle. You're going outside the organization to uh, to address that position if he walks this year. I thought Billings played a pretty decent game for them again. Yeah, didn't he have a sack? Didn't he get he did, Rudolph yeah. that one time? They're, Tomlin's, Tomlin's going to sign him and, and mention that in his, in his press conference next year. I think Billings might be a stealer this time next season. All right, uh, quarterback performance good day. Dave and I, this is from uh, Danielle Russell in Brisbane, Australia, mate. Uh, that's Southern Australian. Uh, I have been disappointed with Mason's play, but has Duck really been that amazing? He certainly shows a willingness to go for the big play, which is refreshing, but I feel I feel he seems pretty inaccurate. I'm, I'm hoping that he'll perform better than Mason, but what do you really think that this team can win a playoff game with Duck? <laughs> I'll worry about if any of these guys can win a playoff game once they get into playoffs. <laughs> uh, there, That's number one, right? I, you know, don't don't get too far out in front of this thing, guys and, and gals. You know, that that's all I'll tell you on that. The, the, the thing that I think is the most concerning with Duck is, is him – maybe wanting to wing it down downfield a little bit too often. So I think that's one of the things to look for with him is interceptable passes of him just trying to trying to chuck it downfield. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, we're not talking Hodges as a long-term guy. Uh, he is what he is, but he's a, probably a better option right now. Um, you're right. The, the risk is there. There's pros and cons to him being as aggressive and as fearless and, and, and let it fly. As he is, and it's fair to say the lore of Doug Hodges is probably greater than the play of Doug Hodges, but I still think he's the better option right now, and he's the guy that's going to help you win now, which is what you need when you're 6-5 and five and, and fighting for your life for a playoff spot. Shucky Ducky, Peter Fox, quack, quack. Uh, what's up, fellas? Let's get right to it. I know we don't like to live in hypotheticals. Uh-oh. So here's some questions about about reality. Is it fair to say Mason's struggles to navigate the pocket has shown little improvement? Uh, that is that is fair to say. I mean, you go back and look at kind of him, uh, the way he he moved around just in the uh, in the Seattle game alone, uh, and look until now, uh, he he's not he's gone backwards in that area. Number two, is it fair to say that Mason's accuracy leaves much to be desired, especially in crossing patterns over the over the middle of the field? I think a lot of that he's not getting the ball. He's he's seeing it late for for starters, and. Uh, accuracy is, is is suffering as as a uh, byproduct of that. Yeah, Alex, I agree. I agree. Uh, if you get it, if you see it earlier and get it out earlier, I I think uh, I think it, there we would see a difference in there. But definitely the last uh, last couple of games, well, definitely the game against Cleveland, uh, we saw that middle of the field. Is it fair to say that Mason's decision making isn't always up to par? I think it's I think it's uh, I think it's delayed decision making. And then uh, the uh, the the interception. Yeah, I don't know. Let's we'll see what the all what he saw in the all twenty two end zone view. I don't know who he was throwing that football to. In in look, uh, one one he should have got the ball out earlier to was the red zone to Tevin Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, I you know that that he he he's made that throw during the preseason before, and got yeah. it out to that guy to Tevin Jones too. You know, really okay. I don't remember that specifically, but yeah, he's got to speed things up. Uh, let's see. And we know his arm strength is limited. Look, I, you know, like I said, the one thing I think that stuck out positive about Mason in that game yesterday is he threw one fifty-one yards down the field and out, 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 out through uh, Washington. I think that was the one positive really from his game yesterday. What if Duck gets a call this week and gets a win? Well, if he, if you, uh, does he start the rest away? Uh, like, like, like Thomas says, you make hard, no hard, hard and fast plans, right? You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but if Duck starts and wins, you're not he, benching Duck until something one no, of those things changes. No, you, you're changes. you're uh, you're you're going to keep playing him as long as you're winning. Yeah. Is it fair to imagine a future with Duck as a backup and Mason gone? Uh, it would I mean, have to be past 2021. Yeah, I'm not. Let's not even think about that stuff. I'm just trying to figure out how to win these next couple of games and get in the wild card race and and, and figure out who your starter is even for Sunday before we think about any of those long term concerns. Knowing you guys, you will probably have already covered most of this during the show. We did, uh, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Brought up anything you guys missed. Appreciate you guys. All right, thank you for that. Uh, let's see, Lenny. 
Lenny writes in, David Knox, I know you guys are willing, are, are waiting until the NFC to pass your final judgment on Mason, but I think you guys can analyze his season right now. He really has no idea what he wants to do with the ball, and I don't feel he's an NFL starter. Let Duck finish the year. Let's face it. Even if we win one more game and finish 7-9, and nine, I think all Steeler fans would have taken that considering our poor start and Ben's injury. Also, Dave, I know you mentioned a. Check this out. Did I mention this, Alex, of, of A.V. walking into Colbert's office and getting a blank check? I think you said something about walking into Colbert's office. I think I said something about a blank check. Okay. But I Which, did not. Yeah. It, I mean, it says, also, Dave, I know you mentioned A.V. walking into Colbert's office and getting a blank check. Do you still feel that way? I know left tackles don't grow on trees, but he's not having a good year. Love the show. Love three podcasts a week. You guys are part of my life. Here's my view on A.V. You're not – you can't pay him – I, I didn't say go in there with a blank check, right? No, I think I did. Okay. I remember that correctly. Uh I don't think you'd let him go in there with a blank check, but on on the, on the same thing, I I don't see how you can justify paying him just five million dollars next season. Yeah, I mean I don't want to be prisoner of the moment. I know it's been up and down for him this year, but I think I have him charged for just two sacks the entire season, and that might it's likely to change after this Bengals game. But there's been a lot of good play that gets forgotten about too. So he, he's worth more than what he's getting getting paid. Uh, I wonder what uh, I wonder what uh, Pro Football Focus has him at. Uh, for yeah, I, I'm not not sure. I mean, again, it's been up and down. Um, but he didn't. He didn't. He had some of the sh- the early season woes that are common to him. He picked things up. These last two weeks have been great. He did face a really good pass rusher in Miles Garrett, who's always kind of had success against him. We'll see how he rebounds this Sunday when you get the rematch with those two guys. Um, so here, here, here's just, what they have. They have uh, they they have him. Uh, two sacks on the season with one against the Bengals. As in yesterday? As in yesterday. So they have, uh, they have him allowing one against the Ravens in week five. They have him allowing one in week 12 against the Bengals. They have him allowing six hits this year, 24 total hurries. They have him down as 32 total pressures when you add up hurries, hits, and sacks. Yeah, I don't know how that is relative to the rest of the league. Do they have a ranking for him? Yeah, yeah, they have uh, by position tackles. Hold on here, I'll I'll give you that blocking uh, and allowed pressures for tackles and the rates. Uh, I always look at that uh, that pass blocking rate of theirs. Uh, where is it? No, they don't have the rates on there. I'm gonna have to find out. Well, what do they it. just have any sort of ranking? Like, is he the tenth best tackle? Is he the twentieth best tackle? Do they have any sort of number to frame this thing? Yeah, let's see here. Offensive grades. Uh, Quisenberry, who's uh, who hasn't. Let's see. Let's, let's look at guys that have played. Ramzik, uh, Lane Johnson, Swartz, Costanzo, Stanley, Lyle Collins. Where's uh, Villanueva down here? They've got Villanueva as a grade at 70.8, okay. uh, which is in the green. And the top is uh, Ramzik at 86.9. Well, where, where's, what rank is Villanueva? Because these numbers don't mean a whole lot. Well, Maybe I, I, would have to, have... I would have to sort it by minimum snaps. Let's see. They don't have an easy sortable. Uh, 80%, 67, let's see. And they don't have them ranked by left or right uh, tackles either here. But uh, let's see, last 17th overall. For all tackles? For all tackles. Tied pretty for, good. Tied for 17th overall. It's pretty good. And that's with 80% playing at least 80 percent of snaps whatnot. okay yeah yeah that i mean again i think i understand the villain has not always been perfect this year but left tackle is a tough job and i think if you look at the whole season in, in totality there's been a, a lot of good uh it does look if you sort by total amount of pressures allowed uh he is eighth overall eighth most and again, that's for all tackles. Uh, yeah, that's for all tackles uh, based on 80%, you know, playing oh, Right, right, right. Gotcha. All right, yeah. Um, again, we'll see how the season goes uh, at the end. you got five more games to, 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 to write this story. Once again, I don't think you go – personally, I don't think you let him go in there with a blank check. But uh, on top of it, I, I don't see how you can I, – I think it's a slap in the face to, to, to expect him to play for $5 million. 
Mm-hmm. I agree. Uh, Bryce writes in, hey, guys, it's Bryce would like uh, would pick the following two Steelers for the obscure jersey challenge. 87, tight end Adrian Cooper, and number 39, Darren Perry. Some questions. Uh, as I wrote last week, this game is a must win. And Tom will confirm my thoughts by Bench and Rudolph. He, he has a bad in. He was bad in the game, but I was surprised Tomlin reverse course made the move. While of course Tomlin is about winning games now, his court, this, uh, his quarterback move showed me that he was treating this game with a must-win type of urgency. <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah, you had an opportunity to win the game. You got to make sure you win the game. Yeah, and if you lo- if you drop this one, you go to five and six again. Your season's drastically different as opposed to six and five. So that was the right approach and the right move. I thought it would be personally. I thought it would be a series later. I thought he'd give him one more. But I, I, I when he threw that thing at uh, at Deontay's feet, I, yeah, you kind of had a feeling maybe a what was coming there. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two from Bryce. I'm curious, even though he's playing like an All Pro, when you look at Mika Fitzpatrick. What are parts of the game that you both feel where he needs to improve, do a better job on? I think sometimes he, I think he gambles a little bit sometimes uh, at, at times, but you know, you, at that position, sometimes you got to gamble. Yeah, there's not many. Uh, the only thing I've ever noticed consistently is just I want to see him be a little more aggressive in his run fills, uh, get downhill a little bit harder against the run sometimes, where I think he kind of wants to wait just to see what happens, where I like to see him explode and, and attack a little bit more aggressively, but that's a very minor complaint. On a scale of one to ten, how would you rank our tight our tight end versus man coverage? Uh, uh, do they do a good job of getting separation, or are they blanket most of the time? Seems like maybe they are getting open as much as they should. I mean, they they look like they look. Go back and look at the one that I pointed out, Mason, uh, in the game against the Browns, kind of later on, uh, on on the one that he threw an interception on. Uh, if he if if, he, if that ball comes out right when right up the seam, that's that's a big gain. I mean, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're getting open now. Has, has Nick Vanette maybe gotten open? Uh, look, there have been some kind of questionable play calls on some of those two uh, you know, as well. Uh, <clears throat> look, you know, I haven't noticed where they've been blanketed at all the time. I guess that's what he's asking. Yeah, I don't have a number for man coverage and scale of 1 to 10. I, I don't know. I don't think either guy has been particularly great this year. McDonald's taking a step back. Granted, so is the whole passing offense. Vanette is never going to offer much as a receiver, especially versus man coverage. He's a zone kind of guy. Um, both guys have to play better, though. And again, I just hope they get McDonald as involved as possible in the red zone. Uh, pod question, quarterback from Matt. Should there even be a question on who to start next week? Mace Rudolph had the opportunity to bounce back and play it as lackluster as I've ever seen since his quality of play is declining. No, I mean, look, we'll see what, uh, it doesn't matter what we think. I mean, we, we think that, that, uh, he'll go the route of, uh, of, of Devlin Hodges here, but maybe we'll find out more Tuesday. Yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up. I'm guessing the rest of the questions are just Duck versus Rudolph. I think we've kind of exhausted that. We'll get Tomlin's answer on Tuesday with some finality and, and go from there and uh, have a beat writer on hopefully a little bit later in the week. We'll see exactly how that goes with Thanksgiving, uh, You know, people having plans and, and, and things like that. But, um, yeah, just get the win, move on. You're in the playoffs if the season ended today, and let's hope it stays that way. Yeah, we'll find out what the uh, what the, you know, how the injuries uh, are shaking out. You would think that's a fairly healthy team. I think the big question now is can you get Juju back? is really the, the biggest question that needs to be answered between now and Sunday, because I think this is uh Doc on wood came out of that game uh, uh, fairly healthy with just uh, TJ Watt and a bone bruise there. So maybe he'll be limited uh, at, at, at the start of the week there. In the meantime, we're going to be looking at the all 22 when it comes out, hopefully later tonight, it'll probably be after Monday night football uh, is, is over with uh, Alex and I will talk more about the breakdowns uh, and what Tomlin has to say on Tuesday on the Wednesday show. In the meantime, you can follow me on Twitter. Twitter at Steeders Depot. Follow Alex on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Follow the show at Terrible Podcast. Email the show the Terrible Podcast at gmail.com. Do you like what we do? Do you like how we break things down? Do we entertain you? Do we amuse you as if we were clowns or at least me? Uh, send a donation to uh, go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the PayPal button up right navigational bar. Also, if you're looking for an ad-free version of SteedersDepot.com, you can help yourself out. Help us out at the same time. Go to SteedersDepot.com. Hit the ad-free button up right navigational bar for $25 for one calendar year. You can have a ad-free version of the site, both desktop and mobile uh, there as well. A lot of people are taking us up on that. Alex, I appreciate it. I will holler at you on Wednesday. And as always, thanks for listening to the Terrible Podcast with Dave and Alex.